Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. And today I am very pleased to have my sometimes referred to as friend and partner, ambiguously so, Jason Hills. Thank you for being here, Jason. Thanks for having me. It's been a, a long time in the making on my part. Cool. Yeah, this is awesome. So, um, okay, I can hear, I just listened back. Uh, your voice is definitely quiet, quieter than mine. So uh, okay. if you want to prompt yourself up a bit. Sure. Um, I'll, uh, I'll take it. So yeah, we're uh, sorry for any of those who are anxiously waiting for this podcast um, uh, for the for the delay. But you know, good things come to those who wait. And uh, so anyway, um, I'm very happy to be able to have a sit down um, on Zoom with Jason. Uh, he and I have a lot of common history, shared history, and uh, we can go a lot of different places. But one thing I've never actually done is uh, pry into his life deeply and that's what I plan to do with this interview <laughs> I think you know more than you think you do <laughs> maybe but uh, I'm about to learn more all right so um, without further ado uh, Jason can you remember actually I like to start off sometimes uh, with sometimes I like to say how do we first meet me I didn't give you that question, but I think it's a fun way to start. If you can remember it, I'm sure your first meet story is going to be a little different than mine. So how do, how do you remember that you and I first met? Yeah, so I was in um, uh, the sing band at James Madison High School, and this would have been sophomore year. And Joey Zuek and Jeremy Batchelor were participating too, I believe, or, or maybe Jeremy was, and I, I knew Joey, but in any case, I forget those dynamics, but they talked about, you know, the band that they're in and that they're, you know, it, it play at um, the guitar's house, you know, or whatever the singer, John Henry. Um, and it was years before I found, realized that Henry was your middle name, but your name was John Henry. Um, but uh, I guess I finally asked you, but um, the, uh, uh, and they were like, Hey, you know, we're looking for a keyboardist. I'm like, well, you know, I have a key, I have a keyboard, <laughs> I play keyboard, you know, playing band, but so they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, maybe we should um, get together. And then uh, I, this must've been the second semester started a chemistry class with Mr. Malik mm -hmm. and you were in that class. So um, I must've said hi to you there. And, uh, and then it wasn't long after. And then that, that day I was riding home on the uh, command bus and the window was open and you were walking home and I was like, hey, John, John Henry. And then you turned and you gave me, I think you're like this, <laughs> no blank expression, like <laughs> walking with your, you right. know, that, that sort of angry teenage metal look. And uh, I guess the rest is history from there. I, I came down and uh, to the basement to audition for the band and uh, um, here we are. I don't know if there was much in between. No, that's about it. And then that was like yesterday almost. So, and right, uh, speaking of the basement, you have the coolest backdrop. Somehow you, not only did you come to Brooklyn from Jersey to be here and just go four houses away instead of actually coming to be in the same room, you actually went to 1996 uh, and uh, time warped as well. How did this you do that? One, this one goes back to 95. You actually can't see it. It's got the... Time stamp. So uh, I, I looked through my photo. I'm like, I really want to put the basement on there. So I looked through my old photos and, you know, there's all these people in them. What's up with that? I couldn't find one that I could just use. Uh, but then uh, you had been getting, uh, transferring those old VHS recordings. Uh, mm -hmm. So I found one where there was like a couple of pans. Fran was filming a few pans by where I was able to just grab a snapshot of it. Got the single Odeon in this one. Mm -hmm. And, um, I forget what the nickname was for, or I guess what that amp was back there. But yeah, I mean, this was, uh, spent a lot of time, a lot of time here. And th this was the first place where uh, I was welcome or I felt welcome to just drop in. I hadn't really, uh, you know, had a friend who kind of just had this open door, just come down whenever and hang out. So, uh, yeah, so was the, that, the, a lot of good memories in the basement. Cool. Yeah, that's really fun to 
see the basement like that. Yeah, I, that's the singalorian up there. Below it is the crate amp. And then to the side, to the left of it would be uh, the matrix amp. Right. And then um, the, the bag of recycling. And uh, God forbid someone didn't recycle that can, they would have, uh, you know, who to speak to. And uh, I think- Yeah, eco, eco, eco angry, John Henry. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll, yeah. I have two more. Um, I will. Uh, I will just change them without any warning, and you'll uh, you could be surprised by the other views at the exact same moment or time in the basement. Oh, okay, fun. Sounds good. Uh, so just to, to 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 chime in on my memory of our first meeting, I, like all those things that you brought up are very fuzzy to me. Um, besides Mr. Malik's class, uh, definitely. I know at that point we were already exchanging cartoons so we must have felt pretty comfortable with each other at some point in mr malik's class because he was yeah, chemistry I mean, by the way yeah we were yeah there was chemistry uh between the, the a fast friendship and yeah we were we were not paying attention and and doodling poor mr malik it was his first we were his first class to teach ever it's a brand right. new teacher and uh, i guess we didn't make it all that easy if if somehow he ever stumbles upon this i mean thanks mr malik yeah <laughs> Yeah, I have good memories of him, right? Because uh, he was pretty gentle on us. Um, and then uh, I, I remember you uh, blaring your trumpet right into the back of my head at uh, Pep Band. At Pep Band. Yeah, yeah, before I knew who you were, really. I mean, I just knew, like, this right. is Jason. He's kind of like, a, he's a who's who of, uh, of musicians here in Madison. That, that's about all I knew. And <laughs> I got up close and personal idea of what what that meant uh really loud trumpet notes in yeah the back sorry of about that yeah i have although, tinnitus i have tinnitus now by the way yeah although I, I was gonna say that's not the loudest thing you expose your ears to though so <laughs> yeah no um but uh but that will be in my autobiography so um for for comic effect uh yeah uh and then yeah just i remember that early period i guess we became fast friends and must have kind of spent a lot of time hanging out one way or another yeah and then when you came into the basement um i'm putting it early 96 but i mean yeah that's no, that what i would right. say that's what yeah. it was because it was it was second semester right so it would have been 96 mm -hmm. um and uh and you know uh well do you do you remember the first time i came down to the basement because i remember oh, yeah. it all i remember it all really well yeah, please share. I, that that's also in my uh, will be in my autobiography because it's <laughs> so it's a key moment. I so I got I, you know so so I played trumpet starting in in um, sixth grade. Uh, Mr. Corn, the music teacher at um, uh, at Roy Rage Man, uh, put me on trumpet even though I wanted to play saxophone, but um, uh, I. Uh, he put me on trumpet because he he saw something. He later told me that it was the thin top lip, or so it was something about that that he felt would be good for the amateur. I'm not seeing any movement on the camera. Did I get disconnected, or did you, or what? I don't know. Oh, there you are. Okay, it, it locked up for a second, so I don't know if one of us was still streaming or both of us were, but in any case, uh, right, so I play saxophone, you put me on trumpet. So trumpet was my instrument. I um, picked it up and I played that thing nonstop. I just practiced, 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 you know, and, and but, but I had taken piano lessons before on and off. So I think it was for my birthday. Um, I, you know, I wanted a, a keyboard. And so we went to Sam Ash. Um, you had probably just been there. I know you, you know, mm -hmm. you know, just testing out some strings or something. Yeah, I pretty much went there Metallica. five days a week. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Were you the first person playing Metallica at Sam Ash? Just like, I, I don't know. I might have been because I was there like when the doors opened almost. Yeah. So, uh, and I got a Yamaha PSR 510. And I loved that keyboard. Uh, I would, you know, I've even considered trying to find an old one because it was just, uh, uh, it was great. It had sequencing and general MIDI and all the instruments because um, uh, uh, I wanted to do MIDI stuff. But so I had a keyboard 
I knew chords. My fingers knew how to press the keys down in a certain sequence, but it's not like I was a piano player. Um, but, uh, you know, you guys are looking for a keyboardist. I didn't know what to expect. What I didn't even think about it, what level of competency or anything like that. So I come down to the basement. I got my big keyboard bouncing around and a keyboard stand. I have it in its soft case. Um, and it was like so awkward. It's like, hey, hey, uh, Jason, oh, hey. Yeah. I'm like, okay, no, that guy, uh, the drummer. I don't know. I pro there were probably was no introduction to Justin or anyone else that was down there. It was just like, <laughs> yeah, you're here now. Why don't you get set up? You can plug into that. And um, so open up my case and out of the case falls a Richard Marks book now i it was my sisters my sisters had taken piano lessons and they had two books there was a richard marks book and there was a movie soundtracks book i have no idea where they came from so that's just what i had so i threw it in the case um that was a defining moment in the initial perception of, i was going down into you know this uh group that was into metal and Richard Marks falls out. And, uh, you know, that was an ongoing joke for a long time. And uh, it bothered me at the time. I'm like, no, I mean, I, it's a book I like, you know, Richard Marks is good, but it's not like I'm a Richard Marks fan or whatever. And I think the joke was I'm a huge Richard Marks fan. I was debating putting on a Richard Marks background, but I'm like, that's a little too, that's a little too deep track for anybody to get it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I got set up and you guys, yeah, you know, why don't we, uh, why don't we just, you know, play a song and I, I mean, my head almost exploded or came closest to uh, that it ever had because what you guys were doing was, you know, it was like real metal, rock, electric, guitar, jamming, soloing, distortion, things I'd never really given a thought to. I had my exposure to like live music was band class and kids, you know, banging around on the drums. It was crazy. I, I couldn't believe. And then and I immediately felt like I can't how am i gonna play this stuff like i don't know how so um you guys jam for a bit we talk to whatever and then it's like all right well why don't we see if you can play a song i think it was we started with except if i'm not mistaken that makes sense and you're like so here are the chords you're like da 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 and i'm like wait what, what, what are they and i had to write them down i still have the book right mm -hmm. i had to write down the chords because i had never memorized music before mm -hmm. and you were not very patient with me, but uh, that's okay. Like it was sort of the, you know, you're the band leader, you, you were testing me out. I think it was reasonable, right? Um, to, to be like, you know, it's like, you know, see whatever. And you're like, no, 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 it's, it's this, like if my hand didn't go to the right chord. And, uh, you know, I knew the difference between major and minor, right? and, you know, and that was all I needed. And then I just played it. And like the trumpet, when I first got it, I went home and I practiced. And I played the chords over and over. Um, I'm not the most natural piano player. My, you know, the way my brain's wired, it's, I can't really do independent hands very well. So um, a lot of it was getting more creative with the sounds and just trying to get more precise on the chord changes, finding ways to get muscle memory for all those changes and um, just figure out like getting familiarized with metal music. I'd never really listened to it. So. I mean, that was the first day I left and we, nothing was said. And I was like, so am I in the band or am I still trying out or what? And I guess I had asked, I asked you when I saw you at school and you're like, yeah, you're in the band. Like, I was like, you know, what are you talking Like, you should know that. It was just a very different social dynamic than I was uh, used to. So much, so much silence, so much silence. Um. <laughs> It's so funny. Uh, it's I really appreciate that perspective, you know, because uh, you know, as you say it, I could I could see that you paint a picture that I could see from the outside a little bit, and realize, oh man, that it's you know, the water that I was swimming in at, in my social life at home was not the water that other oh, yeah. young I mean, guys were necessarily in at all. Yeah, I mean, there was so much leather being worn but you know the, the leather jackets and just like even just stylistically and uh you know some of the one of the other pictures i have um has a bunch of like the posters on the wall and i felt like i'm like i'm, sup I'm supposed to know who all of these musicians and bands are it wasn't okay that i didn't know that um and it was before the internet was what it was so it's not like i could just sort of like look things up 
Um, so I felt very um, unprepared, inadequate in terms of being able to roll with you guys. And so I, I had a lot of homework to do. Um, and it was, um, I think it was, it was a while before we all warmed up and I could really sort of roll with things a bit better and became part of the crew. But probably I was part of the crew a lot sooner than I thought I was. I was just, you know, painting mm -hmm. it that way for myself. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely noticed there was a, yeah, it, it took you a while to absorb. I mean, considering what, what a while was back then, right? A few weeks, a few months compared to now, we feels totally different, but I'm sure it wasn't all that long in perspective. But uh, yeah, I mean, those those silent moments in between can feel <laughs> really long. And yeah, I, me I, I remember when you said it probably was an introduction. I, I, I'm very likely there wasn't. And it probably wasn't from this idea that uh, it's almost, I probably felt on some level that introductions were not cool. <laughs> There's like these weird unspoken rules, you know? It's it like- uh, there, was this, there was an expectation and just that you should know these things. I don't mean you like, it was everyone. There was just right. this idea that you should know the things that I know. And if you don't, then uh, I'm going to make fun of you for it. And that's <laughs> whatever, that's teenage, yeah. that's teenage boys, really. Um, but it was just, you know, I was, I was like, very preppy in comparison. Um, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. But it was, uh, you know, a very um, uh, just different taste, different exposure experiences, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I definitely give you credit for rising to the occasion, you know, because I couldn't tell what kind of uh, where you were on the social spectrum, like you said, kind of preppy, a little bit more in the sort of mainstream cool crowd. I mean, I, I, was, I mean, I was a, it's not like I was popular or anything. I was kind of like a geek and I had a circle of friends and, uh, you know, but, um, you know, I hang out with uh, with my friends from Hebrew school. <laughs> like you know in summer camp um but uh you know it was just it was it was hard coming because the, the 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 group was very established right people that grew up together known each other a long time and the real challenge too was that without fail every time I was there because these would be long stretches someone would come down to the basement that I did not recognize had never seen before you guys all knew who it was and again no introductions and I didn't feel like I could oh hey you know I'm, I'm Jason <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice to meet you. Um, do you like Richard right. Marks? Like I didn't. So I would just pretend like I knew who they were. And that was probably 50% of the people that would be in your basement. I just acted like I'm sorry. I knew who they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Part of me wants to apologize for putting you through that, but that's, you know. No, it was, it was my own doing. It wouldn't have been hard to be like, oh, hey, I don't think we've met before. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. So, uh, yeah, very fun, very fun stories. Thank you. Um, so, can you remember what it was? Uh, so, you, you told me a little bit about the. Uh, how you, so, you, when you started playing trumpet with Mr. Cormick, was that sixth grade you started? Yeah, yeah, it was sixth grade. And then, when you got that keyboard, what year, what, what age roughly? I had gotten it a year earlier. So, um, or you know what it was? Maybe, maybe it was like a gift for graduating junior high school or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe. So probably around the age of 13 or something like that, 14? Maybe 14, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've gotten it. And uh, I guess I had been, but yeah, I, I had because it had a sequencer. And when Mr. Rams um, you know, was kicking off the music program, uh, he let me borrow some trumpet quartets and uh, I sequenced them on the keyboard mm -hmm. and it was a four part, you know, all these four parts and the trumpet playing together and I thought it sounded great and I had Mr. Ram's number. So I was so excited. I just, I remember calling him up and he picked up him he's like, hello. I'm like, hey, Mr. Ram's is Jason. Check this out. Listen to this. And I just started playing it. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, that, that, that sounds great. You know, cool. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll see you tomorrow or whatever. And, I, and my mom had overheard it. And she's like, you didn't want to ask him if he was busy or whatever. <laughs> or, and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I got a little carried away. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was definitely freshman year that I had it. So I had been playing with it and playing around with it for a year. I had mm -hmm. MIDI hookups and everything. That makes sense. 
So you, okay, so you first met Miss Rams in Madison? You didn't know him before? Yeah, no, because he was, if I remember correctly, he was part-time at Marine Park Junior High School the year prior. Like transitioning, maybe, because he yeah, used to be. Yeah, and then yeah. He, got, he got big at Madison, and it was to revamp the program. So uh, I was, well, when did you get into music? Was it sophomore year that you started playing trumpet, or was it freshman year? Freshman, right out of the gate. Oh, so you were there, too. So, yeah, so we were his first, that's right, we were his first class, his first high school um, music class. Um, mm -hmm. so um but yeah you were you were in the more advanced band so i saw in the beginner yeah, there band. was concert band right an intermediate band i don't know maybe but, that well, yeah, came but, later yeah well yeah because was... okay because yeah because well you were you were beginning right you right. got assigned why did you get assigned trumpet or did you ask for it i imagine of all the choices i think i was probably pretty disappointed there was no guitar you know Mm -hmm. and then uh i think my first choice probably would have been drums except that i saw what the drums were <laughs> oh, yeah, playing the snare drum not, or a bass right. i'm like i don't think i'm want to do that really so uh, yeah I, I imagine i might have picked it but i really can't tell you okay probably well, picked it i don't think i want to play clarinet or anything yeah um picturing you a clarinet would be pretty funny like something with the trumpet fit and you would wear the you'd wear the hat um uh which was what i guess i was playing into i'm like this will muffle the sound so i was playing right to the back of your head i should have left it to you yeah. yeah and well i did i didn't i wear it uh when we did that spring musical uh we did the song um i think we called it grim reality composition 57 yeah composition 57 but it had part of grim reality in it the new grim reality oh, really? as a canvas painted gray yeah that was oh, in okay. it mm -hmm. uh, but i was wearing your hat Oh, mm -hmm. so you did give it to me. Oh, all right, good. Yeah, because I, I didn't, I haven't seen that video since. I think I might have seen it in your place once after, uh, but I, I have I, a um, shaky cam version of it that my dad took for me for the so that I could put the cheerleader thing in the uh, <laughs> in the video. So, um, but he has it. I mean, uh, maybe um, I'll, I'll get it from him, and you could use your your setup to uh, digitize it. Mm -hmm. yeah any of the old stuff is fun whenever we get around to it you know yeah um i definitely would love to hear our heavy metal band beauty and chaos live or anything of us playing on video i i used to have videos of that i don't know what happened to them but i maybe don't they know got, yeah maybe they got lost um in the other basement yeah no. um so uh what uh how would you describe the overall influence music has had on your life I mean, uh, more than, you know, more than I would have thought years ago, um, because, you know, looking back on, on things now, I mean, some of the earliest things that I would do um, when I was a kid and I was entertaining myself at home, uh, I have this tape and it's of me three years old and it was a tape recorder and I was recording myself. I guess I knew how to record on it or whatever. And I, I played it once to transfer it into the computer and it recorded it. And now mm -hmm. it sounds like garbage. So it was so old. I had one shot, unfortunately. <laughs> I got yeah. it. But I was playing with that and I was I was singing, um, you know, these songs and doing a show or whatever. So I was always fascinated with the, like the audio equipment and the tape player and the record player. And left to my own devices, I, I was playing records, going through my dad's collection, which was very eclectic. Um, I don't know what drove him to buy some records versus others, but it was a lot of classics, right? There was, um, you know, a lot of Billy Joel in there. Um, there was uh, um, some, re and actually um, uh, my uncle Henry went me records too. So, so, so it was with a record player and uh, Journey's Greatest Hits is probably the record that I listened to most and I would play it and I would take the, I want to see, do you have a lot, the sleeve, the jacket, uh, which had the lyrics on it. And I would sit there and I would read the lyrics for the whole album. Mm. And that's what I would do. So, uh, and I would try to figure out what what the song meant. Um, like, what did they mean by the lyrics? Try to interpret it, that sort of thing. And then uh, if I was feeling adventurous, I would sing along. So early on, I was, I was you know, fascinated with the, the structure of songs, the idea of it, of, of how music 
is played and reproduced and everything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that form helped me form a lot of my analytical thinking um, just about sounds and music and notes. And, and once I was exposed to performance, right, I was, I was starting to put things together of, oh, well, that must be what it's like to do this and that you know, when you're playing, oh, this is what it's like, must feel like if you're in an orchestra, because I listen to a lot of classical music too. Um, and some of the first, C the first CD I bought, it was a, a, a six CD set of Mozart. And I might've been with you when we went to the record store, which was called uh, King's Plaza. Um, I'm blacking out on it, it's not there anymore. Sam Goody was the one in King's Sam Goody, Plaza. That's the one. Mm -hmm. And, um it was dirt cheap classical music was not it was always in the, the bargain bin <laughs> so i you know I, I would listen to it so you know music it was all around and i was constantly listening to stuff that's still true today um and uh you know lately i've been thinking that that maybe too much stimulation right maybe that you know sometimes just sitting in silence because one of the uh my favorite things to do uh, still is is find an opportunity to sit on a nice day where there's a cool breeze and just listen to the sounds and just, you know, think about stuff. I don't really do that much anymore because I've always got earbuds in, I've always got music playing, um, whether it's, you know, lately it's always kids music or the same songs over and over. Um, but, uh, you know, the music for certain songs, I have associations, I have memories, right? For mm -hmm. when I first heard it, what the lyrics, you know, mean, things like that. I'll often look up the history of songs that I like to mm -hmm. try to understand what the artist was thinking when they made it. And um, uh, and music is one of the things that you can have in common with someone that you've never met before, just like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, uh, it's, it's a, I guess it's a big question, um, but uh, you know, it's just been a constant presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. Um, so, Oh, well, I, it's kind of very connected to the same question, but can you just say a little bit about the power of music in general, like not just in your life, but how you see it? It's yeah, power? Uh, you know, it's um, it's interesting. There's there's this uh, concept of and, and um, I pulled it up in case I, I want to throw it on the screen, but I don't think I'll do that. But uh, it's the idea that there are eight types of intelligence, right? There are eight different things that um, people can have strengths in and you you start to go through them and you know some of it starts to make sense you know it, you know a lot of the traditional things about intelligence you know about problem solving and and even like physical intelligence you know being athletic things like that but one of the eight is music and you know it's about the the intelligence of deciphering tones being able to um you know perform things compose things like that um but uh, uh i think it just points to the profound impact that music um has on people and uh you know even throughout history like the the earliest um you know humans there's evidence that they had music they had songs they had chants right the first musical instrument was the voice and and i imagine that percussion probably came next right and mm -hmm. uh, i think it's it's built in to uh what we are and the power is is uh it impacts us, it influences us, so, you know, our mood. It's, it's like um, not to, not to, you know, give away your, your upcoming release, but the capital H health around music, it, it, it can be tied into um, everything. So, I mean, I, I think that there are certain parts of our brain, parts of our, uh, who we are that get triggered by music in a good way or a bad way. Um, and in some cases, it's just, um, it's just in the background but it, it's a source of like familiarity and comfort. So I think it's just like taste and smell, right? Where it's tied to memories and it's tied to feelings and things like that. I think music's no different. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something, it really is. Um, yeah, because especially you see with kids, right? Like we both have young children and if I put a song on, particularly a song that my son might like or just has a beat that he can relate to you'll see it you know you'll see it in his body movements and his mm -hmm. mood immediately where you know an adult might not show it so 
quickly, but uh, or visibly. But yeah, there's something really powerful. Yeah. Um, and I was witnessing that. I would guess that if humanity had to start over and forgot everything, that music would come about and it would sound pretty similar. <laughs> uh, like I don't think I, I I think that music has um, uh, you know the fact that, that we use uh, intervals of tones the way that we do primarily mm -hmm. right uh, versus um, you know there are other scales out there other ways to do it uh, but I, I think it's it's just it's just built in to human beings yeah into the the universe itself in a way right like yeah. uh, how, why is it that when you hit a low C on the piano the fundamentals, the harmonics that are ringing out actually on the higher end are a C major chord. They just ring naturally. Yeah, I know? mean, there are elements that elements give off frequencies. Mm -hmm. right? That's how, you know, um, uh, is it 440? Like, you know, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, they, they listen on a certain frequency because that is the frequency that um, hydrogen, the most um, uh, uh, prolific element in the universe gives off. At the energy at that frequency and so the idea is well if there were other intelligent life out there they would know that too and they would use this frequency for broadcasting to look for other intelligence mm -hmm. so it's it's like built in because you know it's all sound waves are it's it's just it's energy yeah mm -hmm. so uh all right now let's get to some more fun stuff we got pretty deep there for a minute let's get to some more as i tend to do uh, lighthearted fun stuff which um so can you speak about some of your favorite memories uh musical experience memories it's funny a lot of them are, are like bad musical performances that this they just stand out um uh uh a lot of memory i mean and a lot of memories that that, that i associate with music are tied to performance right because mm -hmm. those are those are intense moments and you know it it, it having performed uh, you know in, in in various settings um not to the you know and you perform to some really big crowds um i perform when i have the biggest probably at carnegie hall when i did the thing in junior high school with um all borough where the performance mm -hmm. was at carnegie hall um it wasn't it was parents of the kids performing right and and, and special guests but it was full like carnegie hall every seat was taken that's a that's a big uh, crowd. And then it was Lincoln Center with uh, with All City, um, and then it was you know different size groups when we were performing. And there's something about that zone that you get into that when you're it you're you're nervous, or at least for me, like there's a lot of like nervous energy because I just want to get to the point where the performance starts and setting up. So I remember I, my hands would be shaking, like setting up the keyboard stand and getting everything plugged in, and I'd be running around like a uh, 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 you know. Like I didn't, couldn't keep track of anything. But then once it started, it was like, breathe that sigh of relief, get in the zone and just do what you're gonna do. And um, whatever happens, happens. You can't really, it's out of your control at that point. Whatever your abilities are, or whatever is gonna happen with uh, playing through. Um, and, and it's sort of this relief because there's so much energy that goes into just going there and doing it. So. A lot of those memories, like performing, uh, I think, you know, playing at the Elba Room, all those times that we did were great memories. Um, just being on stage, uh, having random people show up to come see us uh, doing your CD release party there. Um, I mean, that, is it a CVS or a Rite Aid? I don't forget which, or Walgreens, it's pharmacy now. I think it's a CVS. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that building, there are a lot of memories there. And even just, um, you know, the achievement of the first performance, you know, when you're young, the first time you play, like the first time I played in junior high school in the band, you know, was a, uh, felt like a big deal. And, you know, my family, um, you know, people were congratulating. And I remember people like bringing their kids flowers and stuff. Maybe there was <laughs> an opportunist outside with a, a cart of, you know, a shopping cart full of flowers, but, you know, it, 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 a lot of the memories with music around performance, it's performing with other people. I've never really done much solo, um, but uh, it's just, it's that connection, that communication and um, just a little bit of a diversion. Like just the idea that a bunch of 15 year olds or 14 year olds or whatever can get together and make music so well 
and 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 take that creative energy and turn it into something like like they do i mean that was what blew my mind because what you guys were doing i thought only adults could do mm -hmm. right and you know that was what i was thinking but uh all these memories like it's associated with the people that i was either listening to the music or performing the music with um very few of my you know memories around music uh are independent mm -hmm. yeah interesting yeah very uh yeah, unique perspective um yours to hear you know and to consider for me uh even though i, I know you so well I, again like i say i haven't really taken a deep dive on your personal experience of music throughout your life you know yeah yeah it, it's uh i don't think it's something that we've really talked about much like this mm -hmm. um <clears throat> So thank you everyone who's watching. I just want to uh, take a moment to thank everyone who's watching live and if you're watching on the replay, thank you very much. Feel free to hit the heart button and leave a comment or ask a question to Jason um, as we go along. Um, so what did you enjoy most about being in a band? I wanted to say, also say what did you like least about it? You go there if you want, but mainly what did you enjoy most about it? uh most most everything it was uh one of the um i really felt like it was one of the places where like i really felt like i belonged and and in the moment of playing because you know 99.9 .9 of a band's playing time is is jamming or rehearsing right it's not performing for others necessarily um but um i love being able to create music because uh, when I think back like all of the the songs uh for Beauty and Chaos the, I associated them with a color don't know like uh, Nice Day to Die was green um and, like a dark, a dark green I guess darker kind no. of yeah you know it would be a darker green there's no way that that song would uh, uh ever be a bright and you know bright and yellow sunny uh mm -hmm. that sort of thing like my home was like a red color and and i don't know it 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 uh i enjoyed getting in the zone and a lot of times you know when i'd be playing i'd look around and i'd look around at the people that i was playing with and it was um uh i don't know it was like this uh just this connection you know it goes back to the the people because you know uh, i'm i'm connecting with people socially like i'm an introvert that doesn't come as naturally to me but when you're performing music with someone or um even like when we would sit down and you know uh you know make changes to a song together like the middle part of dark winter or the transition for beauty and chaos that second part um i mean those were uh really those are were creations that i took part in you know like uh, uh producing your albums um so you know i think those are the things i liked most about being in a band was i knew i was creating memories i knew i was creating lasting experiences but and i knew that those songs um because even even if it was just a little you know single recording of it that sounded like garbage i could pull that up anytime right and i'm starting to understand this about myself that i may I'm a hoarder, not of things, but of markers of experiences. I want to be able to get to those things that to trigger those memories and because that brings me back there. Um, I listen to, um, you know, our band stuff and your recordings um, constantly over the years because it, it brings me back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I I did see that even more so, particularly since maybe you've you've left your the nest right you, you don't live in brooklyn for a long long time now so that that must there must be a yearning for for brooklyn or at least your roots somehow yeah so i imagine the music helps a lot with that yeah and, and um so i just and you mentioned the good stuff and the bad stuff it uh if i try i can remember bad stuff but that's not the stuff that comes to mind right everything mm -hmm. uh, uh everything's rosy uh in in the memories um so uh I mean, being in a band, things were stressful. We would argue about stuff. We would fight, right? The people would 
not be reliable. I was never really able to perform up to the level that that was needed. Um, those were, you know, frustrating things. You guys had like an intervention with me because of my, you know, it was viewed as like a lack of investment in the band and everything, um, uh, which was fair. Um, it, it, you know, didn't like those things about it, but when you put it all together, I mean, it was overall these like really positive experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't, didn't remember that intervention part, but I, I, I can vaguely remember it. And it just goes to show how freaking ridiculously seriously, serious we took, took that stuff. Yeah. Well, know? it was like, cause, cause you were like, Hey, uh, we're going to have a, a band meeting. You know, we got to talk about some things and I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. sounds good. And then you're like, you know, we have that band meeting later. And then I think like Dave and Jeremy mentioned it too. And I'm like, said to you, I'm like, oh man, this sounds serious. I wonder what it could be. It didn't like dawn on me. I'm like, if everybody's telling me there's this serious thing we need to talk about, and I have no idea what it is, it must be about me. <laughs> so I was kind of, you know, blindsided by that, but uh, it was, it was justified, um, you know, looking back, but it was, um, uh, it was tough because I, I felt like, like internally I was, I was very invested, but my behaviors weren't, um, indicating that and mm. uh so you know it's hard to hear when you're kind of surprised where like you know all of your close bandmates uh and you know take a lot of pride in the band and then everybody sits you down and it's like you know do you even want to be in the band it's like yeah like what what do you guys need me to do because I'm, I'm doing what i thought was so anyway but okay. uh you know even even that isn't um uh, is not a negative memory for me. Uh, it was, I learned a good lesson that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, funny. So when you first told me that, when you just started bringing it up about um, the intervention with you as keyboard, I thought you meant Beauty and Chaos. So I was like manufacturing this false. Oh, no, there was no, so then, there was no intervention with Beauty and Chaos. It so then Motor Stones, yeah, later. So uh, we got uh, our good friend, James Behan Jr. Nice. Who says, great to see you both chatting about music. And he said he learned... James says, I learned so much from Jason about directing a band when he led us for Sing 98. And then he said, being the weakest link in that band was one of the greatest gifts of my life musically. Thanks for inviting me to the cool kids table version of the band. <laughs> the John Fogarty project was a beautiful labor of love by Jason for you, for me, John Henry, and was so cool to see the finished product. Yeah, so James, thank you. James's insight is really, it's really uh, refreshing and fun to hear his perspective of that era. And thanks, James. That, that I, I really appreciate that. The um, I learned a lot about leading a band too. <laughs> I said, yeah, because I had never done it, and you know, there were a lot of things that I wish I could do it again. But uh, you were not the weakest link. You were the keystone, right? We needed the biggest, most important thing, and and the thing that people heard the most. Uh, to drive things forward with the drums. So um, I, I, I appreciate uh, your perspective, but I mean, uh, you were you were the keystone of the band, actually. So, so was, was that for, for was that the band? Sorry, I'm sorry about that. Was that the band that uh, played um, uh, "Eye of the Tiger"? Or was that yep. different? Yeah. yeah, and "Living on a Prayer." Um, yeah, okay. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was James on drums, and uh, Mike Barris was playing bass. Um, and, and, you know, giving me that, I hate you look every time uh, I looked at him, which he just did at the time. We were joking about it not too long ago. Um, and, uh, and you're on guitar and I was on, I guess, keys and trumpet and I, something that I think about probably once a month for no good reason is you had two guitars set up because one of them was capoed on the second fret because there were some songs that it was just easier for you to play, um, the chords that way. And I would tell you which guitar you needed for which song. And of course on performance night, I screwed up on one of them. And there was a girl, I wish I remembered her name, but it was her solo. And you picked up the wrong guitar because I told you the wrong guitar and you started playing the song and you did the best that you could admirably where, where you were transposing it in your head to the point that you know no one noticed but it was the last chord progression at the end that got messed up and i turned around I'm like what's up he's like you told me the capo, capo guitar and i'm like oh man and i thought to myself 
why was I telling you? Why didn't we just have you write down which guitar it was on your sheet music? <laughs> like the, that would have been a much simpler solution because I beat myself up over that one. I'm like, wait a minute. That was just a, that was bound to happen with uh, the way we were doing it. But anyway, um, yeah, that was, uh, so thanks for bringing that one up, James. That's a good memory. Yeah, that's funny. I, again, that, that, that thing about the capo guitar, such a tiny dot of a memory but i'm sure if we the more we talk about it, i would probably un see the whole picture play before me you know and, and um, the sing band was an example it was the reverse of me coming into your basement in terms of where i was going into your world and social circle coming mm -hmm. to the sing band you were coming into mine and and on day one um we we set up and everybody was like oh man there's a guitar player right check it out and you had all these people around you asking you to play songs a lot of metallica stuff or whatever and you were jamming and people were losing their minds and uh i was like excited for you or whatever i don't think it you know it was like this profound experience for you but for me I, it was like the mirror experience where i went down and joined beauty and chaos and there are all these people i didn't know and whatever and then you came and it, it was i don't know it was cool to see for me yeah and that was very cool to be able to be that outsider metal guy and then to be become you know the insider as towards the end of my madison days but it didn't take long for you to shed that metal guy image uh which <laughs> came out in that screen musical you, you're just be, you were you know your true self came out where you yeah. were just having fun being a goof and just enjoying yourself yeah yeah i, I never was a true metalhead um so so james said uh, we were an 80s cover band before being an 80s cover band was cool yeah. <laughs> yeah pretty much pretty there you much. go yeah no but I, yeah i agree with you that james was definitely the keystone of that band um yeah i mean maybe james was the most green in the band in a sense uh on his instrument possibly but i don't his heart and his uh um his willingness to share the common goal and and practice and, I mean, I don't think he played out of time. No, I, I I, there are no stories about that time that James flubbed up the song, right? So <laughs> I, I don't uh, remember it. That, yeah. that, that, that never happened. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I ever would remember, like, uh, what's not chastising James for, but like kind of getting on his case, would just be to ask him to hit it harder. That's the only thing I would have ever said, I imagine. Yeah, which, which ironically, knowing now, like, um, uh, you got a pro drummer in that sort of situation, with the way the sound was set up on a big equi room, they're not going to hit the drums hard because they mm -hmm. would they would they would dominate all the sound. Right. No, it was very wise the way he it played, was. Yeah. It was it was yeah. really wise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. No, playing with James was a lot of fun, and I I, I had even thought like, man, one day if I need a drummer and do my own music. I would uh, love to have James. It never happened, but uh, that that's how I regarded you, James, as someone I would love to play with um who knows maybe we'll jam again one day in person uh so jason uh jason hills um what is one of the greatest lessons you've learned about learned along your journey of life that keeps you moving forward optimistically or you know with uh yeah with a, and a lot of it ties back to some of the things i think i've been talking about related to music and you know there's this um it's sort of try to take something away from each day, you know, learn something every day, keep learning. And, and those are the, the experiences like the, 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 the goal is to pursue happiness, I think. And uh, if you do that in, in the right way, right, it'll be contagious and, and it'll spread and, and it, it, good things will, uh, will come. And a lot of, even when I look back at music, like it was, I do wish that I would have just enjoyed myself more in the moment than trying to be so intense. Remember the, the, the gig that we booked just sort of overlooking the fact that we were not of age to go to pyramid club. And it's our first gig and we got everything mm -hmm. set up and there were like six people coming and then we get there and they're like, you can't come in here. You're not 21. That's what we, what we uh, said. And I was like, well, you know, I wasn't sure if it was but like devast being devastated over that or whatever. It's actually, you know, in the end, it's kind of like a pretty funny memory or a funny story. 
and it doesn't really matter that that wasn't a, it wouldn't have been a it actually wouldn't have been a great first gig either right, no, right under the stress of that so um it uh and, and the lesson wasn't learned either because when modus tollens played its gig i forget the name of the bar dave wasn't 21 yet and you guys kind of skirted around that mm. um and managed to not get him carded or something so but in any case like not that you know everything with me was so intense and serious and um as i've gotten older i mean it's like not everything is such a big deal really it really really isn't it's just you know it's just not worth it and just try to look at every experience as you know there's no if if in every experience in life whether it would be deemed a success or a failure if you've learned something from it if you come away from it a bit of a different person hopefully you know better or that you've you know wiser that's what i'm looking for um you can't fail it's just a question of how much wisdom do you come away with and in fact you know i think a life where everything goes perfectly you know i think you know like you know that's like a twilight zone episode where the person has all the luck and everything just always goes their way i think that was a twilight zone episode <laughs> that what kind of life would that be that'd be pretty boring and you'd never learn anything that everything that everyone ever knows is because really either because they tried something and it didn't work which led them to try something else that did work or someone else tried something that didn't work, led something to work and then told you that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I guess in the end, it's like, try not to like, everything is not so serious and intense. And, um, and th that's what the, the driver of the van that, that the guy we paid to bring our equipment back, whatever, that's what he was trying to tell me. He's like, cause he saw in my face, like just how devastated I was. And he's like, dude, this is not, a big deal like you should just relax a little bit he's like you know i just i just had to fold the business that i lost fifty five thousand dollars on and i didn't have a face like you have on right now so like just take it easy so you know it, it's sort of that intensity i think a lot of it comes with age a lot of it comes with having kids because you can't keep up that intensity when you have these you know uh uh, uh you know these uh, where kids they're, they're dependent and they need things and you know they, they they're experimenting and learning the world so you have to help them through that um anyway so that's uh right. that's what i take away from it yeah absolutely um yeah i also had an intensity of a distant of a different sort when i was younger as i'm sure you remember and yeah lightening up over the years in in every way you know with, with the, what I put into my body, with uh, what I read and consume, listen to, create. Uh, yeah, it's that that's really that's the lesson of nature, right? It, nature is just it, it, it's serious, but it's also not serious. And you just it's always in the now moment. And uh, you're always going to leave whatever moment you're in for the next. And just kind of we learn, learn what we can as we go and uh enjoy enjoy the experience mm -hmm. um yeah i think you could pump up your volume a tiny bit if, okay. if that's all right sure. uh i'm having a little noise here i'm trying to mute when when noisy in the house but i can't do it all the time yeah all right i back it up a bit all right so um so how has your taste in music shifted and evolved over the years I mean, it's remained eclectic. Um, there was definitely uh, a leaning towards, so like like I was saying, when I was listening to records, it was whatever my my dad happened to be into. Um, and uh, and then it was a fair number of like movie soundtracks and things like that, that that's what he had in the collection, I guess for things that he, he was into or wanted to listen to. Um, and th these were all records that were purchased before I was around. It was just stuff that he had. I don't remember, really remember him bringing home many records um, uh, when I was growing up, you know, then it became like tapes and CDs and things like that, uh, if anything. Um, but uh, he, um, yeah, it, it introduced me to a lot of different styles of music. And I just had this appreciation for everything, even like the Tenderfoot March, which was the first song I ever played in a um, band. I brought it home and my sister who had played flute with Mr. Korn, we put on a little concert 
for uh, uh, for my family playing the tenor from March because I got the flute part and just I don't know I, any any sort of uh, music I you know I like I just find myself appreciating it for for what it is if it's a if it's a quality piece it doesn't seem to really matter what the genre is um, I can appreciate it but I, I as far as you know given a choice of what to listen to um, in most scenarios I, I tend to like things that have a lot of like energy behind them like you know the whole st planets right mars mm -hmm. like if there's a classical piece that really just drives i like hearing different versions of that um if i just want to pick up something that like dream theater i just i i love i love the group because of the things that they do and it you know there's a genre that we had talked about um uh like uh math rock um which i, I don't think you've spent too much time looking into but it's this like newer genre where there are it, it's a genre for musicians because if you listen to it it's very you know it sounds like progressive metal it's it's very complex but you have to watch it being played because the way that they're playing it is you know almost superhuman it's like how can i do things on my instrument that will just blow someone's mind if they knew how hard it was to do that and um um i've been spending some time when I have available to to go look into that because it's a genre that to appreciate it re really you kind of have to, you have to be a musician and you have to watch it you have to watch the music video you have to watch a live performance you can't just listen to it and it's been a long time since I've come across a genre well it's you know that you know it's like Broadway like musicals you gotta see the performance because that's where a lot of the emotion comes in there's dancing and things like that it's not just about the song um uh or, or the sounds so um i i definitely appreciate genres that go beyond just the song itself to where it's about that bigger experience so i think you know broadway is probably you know musicals is probably the the ultimate example of that where it's 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 there's more to it than just the song hmm. any specific broadway musical music that you would uh recommend people to check out oh boy that's a good question i mean you know i i spent my time as a, a rent head um which mm -hmm. i think was the term was in fact i i brought you along with me for a lottery which we won and we sat right. in the first row opposite sides of the uh <laughs> of the audience and then um uh uh i, I mean that's a tough one um uh also because I'm so bad at just recalling names of things um, off the top of my head. Um, but uh, we know what I will recommend is uh, for anyone who who's listening, if they haven't checked it out, uh, the show, it's on Apple plus uh, Central Park. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, Josh Gad um, uh, is the executive producer, but it, it's, it's a cartoon in the style, the animation style of like Bob's Burgers. There's some of the same creative team. Uh, but the every episode is like this epic musical and they have all these songs that are just incredibly well done and it's this you know really uh, amazing work where everything is put together from the the animation to the lyrics telling the story to the music styles that come through and and all of the voice actors are seasoned um, vocal performers it's just uh, great so it's tough right now because it's not a, a time where anyone can really go and see a musical um, uh, all that easily uh, or even performances like the, the, one of the things that I was um, looking forward to moving out to the suburbs here, Cherry Hill, uh, was seeing what community theater, student theater groups, um, you know, even if there was like a community band uh, and um, there are those things, but they haven't been happening with the pandemic but what they've been doing is they've been doing these uh virtual versions where it's like all done on zoom and then the, you know somebody edits, edits it together um so it's nice that it's um still happening uh but just in general um i think it's hard to go and see these sorts of performances but to to really get a nice sampling of it i think central park is a great show cool I and mean, that's a, sh a tv show or it's an animated show yep um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a cartoon. It looks like Bob's Burgers, um, and uh, it sounds like a Broadway musical. Oh, okay, cool. You know, y Yoko and I got into uh, um, 
Glee for a little while, a couple years mm-hmm. back, and very impressive. Um, I, I like the the Glee version of uh, Don't Stop Believing, mm-hmm. maybe more than uh, the Journey version. I don't know. It was really moving. Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't agree with you on that one. <laughs> um, not not to take away from the Glee performance, uh, but it, I, I actually recently dove into the song because I used it as part of a video I did for uh, Haley's birthday. And uh, I watched the Glee version and listened to it and, and looked at other live performances and different performances. And, um, you know, the Glee versions are really, they're well done, but they're almost too, they're almost overproduced. Yeah, super and polished. Not yeah. at all. And it's just not believe like the setting, it's just not believable. And at least for me, that kind of ruins it. And uh I used to I watched Glee years ago. It just there's it's such a heavy helping of cheese in the you know, the plot devices and everything that uh uh it's a good show, but it was hard for me to get into it. Well, being a vegan, I, I've been missing cheese from my diet. So when I got that cheese from a non-animal source, I really appreciated it. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. That's food for thought. Yes, please think about it that way. I will. <laughs> Speaking of cheese, I don't know if anybody here knows, probably nobody knows this, okay? Mm-hmm. You and I collaborated on a musical, a short form musical in Binghamton at Binghamton University where the topic was Behold the Power of Cheese. Yes, right. And I don't remember what the music sounded like. But oh, I, I remember it. Were... Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah. Cheese, cheese, cheese. We all love to eat cheese. It suits all our needs. Behold the power of cheese. That was the chorus. Wow. Uh, yeah. Now I remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have probably blissfully forgotten that song. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds familiar. Uh, I mean, I, I remember that I had that script when you shared it with me. I, I put it in my. Uh, what's the word my nostalgia file yeah and so just first for everybody watching for the story about john i mean he was a good sport because he came to visit me up at binghamton i was there for two years and he um uh the first time he came to visit we spent a good part of it sitting in the laundry room and he had just really started on your 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 like folk songwriting uh career um or just you 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 wrote some songs that were nothing like you'd ever i'd ever heard from you before right, um right. Uh, mount mountain cabin dreaming right mm-hmm. and uh i think that was the first time you played daddy and traveler so yeah. you, you you came with this library thing that i i had never heard before um and i think you visit again next semester and it was for a weekend and they were doing this competition and i was like hey do you want to help out with this and you're like sure and it turned into a whole thing it ended up you know you were you taught someone how to play it and it like ended up taking up the whole weekend um although the first time you visited you were you were really um uh you know deep in in getting into the the music theory and the courses at the conservatory and we went to a bar which we shouldn't have been in i guess at our age but we got in and uh we got a pitcher of beer and sat in the back you took a napkin and we were trying to write out the notation for the beats of the dance music. <laughs> this is how cool we were. Right. right. This is you, what we were doing. There were a lot of girls flocking around us, just begging us to get on the dance floor with them. Remember when that happened? You're like, no, no, I gotta get, I gotta get this notation right. Um, I gotta get all the, the staccatos just correct. And so, no, 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 I think this one, I'm gonna try to write this, uh, this one in seven, eight. That'll, that'll be, that'll be more fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that that's uh, that, that's what interested me, and in that that could uh, that we can sort of like find common space on. Because I was in that bar, I'm like, I don't know what to do. You know, it was a dance club. It wasn't really my scene, but yeah, you know, it was very cool to check it out. Uh, when you're young, you gotta experience things. Oh, no, I mean, I I enjoyed it. It was mm-hmm. totally. I'd much rather be doing that than try to dance. So um, uh, mm-hmm. that was good. It was just uh, uh, you know. You came to visit and it turned into writing a musical, which I don't think was on, you know, was part of the plan, but I guess you enjoyed it. I don't know, it's hard to tell with you sometimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I certainly don't remember not enjoying it. I was I was glad that you actually had a, your own musical vision that you wanted to do, because that's rare. That was rare at, at that time that yeah. you, you were like asking me to do this particular vision. So I thought that was cool. 
Um, yeah, so we could take a little segue. Any other funny memories or uh, um, remember when stories that, that pop to mind that might be fun for people who might, well, live, I think, uh, I don't know. James, thank you for watching. If you're still there and anyone else who's watching, thank you. On the replay, who knows who might be watching this uh, maybe in uh, 20 years from now or 15 years from now, our children will watch this hopefully and learn something or about may, us. Or maybe one of us will watch it or we'll get together and watch it in 20 years. Um, and, and laugh. Uh, and what? And laugh. Together. And laugh. Yeah. yeah. Hard, hearty laugh. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> I, I think that going back to like when like we became fast friends, it was because it didn't take long that maybe it was like two, three weeks after I started coming down to the basement that I found myself in the basement with just you. Everyone else had left and you became different <laughs> and you became your goofy self and you and I were goofing around and I remember for probably a good 45 it was almost midnight like i really should have gotten on my bike and gone home long ago um and we spent 45 minutes finding funny ways to run across the room and high five each other <laughs> i don't know if you remember this basically yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and <clears throat> um i think that's what it was it was that you uh you opened up and i saw the real you not that the you, the the stoic metal John wasn't the real you, but it, I, I saw your, you became vulnerable. Whereas when there's all of these, you know, these teenage guys in the basement, right? You gotta, you know, it's like a survival of the fittest. Like it becomes uh, Darwinian in nature and you just have to, it, you're, you're basically, you're hanging out, but you're watching your back because you don't want to be the next one. That's the target of a, um, you know, a friendly, uh, a friendly joke or insult or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So you let your guard down, and you, right. you, you know, and I let my guard down, and we let each other in. So that that that's a fun memory. Another one was um, uh, Dave Evans was in the basement. This was maybe a year later or something like that. You had a bunch of cardboard boxes, and <laughs> we spent an hour creating these different scenes of why is it that we would run and fall into this big pile of cardboard boxes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that was... about that. And, and we did it over and over again. We must have been so sweaty and full of cardboard oh. dust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cardboard. <laughs> yeah. And uh, paper cuts, I guess. And um, yeah. I mean, those are some of the best memories, uh, memories too, mm -hmm. because, you know, it was, there was, a, when you're a bandmate, there was like a bond. Like it, it was this additional... Uh, element of, of the friendship and um mm -hmm. i don't know just just to be able to do that and it, it made us better bandmates to uh uh to have those sorts of connections um but uh yeah just goof around your basement great great times great memories and um uh you know there are some there's very few that i wouldn't want to share on a podcast that um <laughs> or that's going to go up on facebook and youtube in perpetuity um, but, uh, you know, for, for all of what it looked like, um, there was a lot of good, wholesome fun, uh, down mm -hmm. there. And I remember, uh, and this was when like technology was, um, was coming about and, and, you know, there was this discussion. It's like, what did people used to do right before there was like, you know, computers, they listen, you know, they, they could do all these things. Like, how did people, I, you know, the question I asked, I'm like, how did people stay, entertained how did they stay engaged when all they had i'm like i don't know and it's like like what did what did our our parents generation do like they would just like sit around and listen to records i'm like that, that that's crazy how could they do that and what it turned out was we i looked around i was like wait we've been down here for about an hour playing different albums i think the only difference is these are cds <laughs> and it's like oh yeah i guess that's what Hey, you want to get together and listen to some records? We don't say it that way, but that's mm -hmm. what we would fall into. Yeah. Yeah. And so these are all the all the musicians that I had to go home and look up in my encyclopedia. <laughs> and you know, and any uh I know my uh 1968 world encyclopedia probably had all of them in there. Well, yeah, my 1982 um, <laughs> uh, encyclopedia set that my parents had, it was um 
uh, world book. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it covered all of them. Uh, yeah, maybe not. But, you know, I, I, I emulated this. I, I, I got, I bought a few copies of Hip Creator and I found like typo negative posters and stuff like that. And I put that up onto the wall next to my like world, the wall size world map with all the flags that I got. And it was like this very weird mix of things. And I would hang up all of the flyers from our gigs that we would mm -hmm. have and things like that. Um, That's awesome. I, I, uh, I found in one of these um, VHS videos that I uh, digitized recently that there, I, I couldn't get all the dates of the Dean Chaos gigs in 97. Yeah. And there was a flyer that had three dates on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was able to look at those dates and then my mother's uh, date book from 97, I found it and it corroborated it. And, wow, um, Linda. Yeah, so that was cool. Um, do you remember, so here's a question. Do you remember uh, if we played the lines then? Because we had it, it was on that flyer. It was in my mom's date book, but I don't have a memory I of playing it. I don't think we played it. Um, and I don't know why that would be the case. Where was, mm, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to like try to look it up and see it. Wait, it wasn't it's, across. That was the bitter end that was across the street from the elbow room, right? Right. It's, it was it? about two blocks from the elbow room. It, I think it's Sullivan Street. Yeah, uh, I don't think, it, I don't yeah, think we ended up like playing a, it. That's starting to ring a bell that we had a gig at the Lion's Den and it fell through for some reason. And I don't know why. Yeah, I think that's- uh, There may be, there may the be in, those, in the, those emails um that we got for everyone listening so john has been writing his autobiography and uh he's been piecing things together the timeline and because like i said i'm a digital hoarder on a, a drive i have every single email i've ever received or sent going back to what did it start in like 99 i think it was 99 mm -hmm. so i have all of it and we, I had a, we had separate modustolens.net email accounts and there was AOL and there was all that. So um, uh, pulled all those emails and there was a lot of information in there for the timeline. The funny thing too, is just the way that we communicated with each other and this idea that like, I remember that was a time that you'd only get like two emails a day. And <laughs> right. so, and that was Including like, spam. <laughs> right, right. It's like, you've got mail. It's like, oh, look. And um, it was very different. You could tell just in the way that the emails were responded to that it was, and maybe this is me because I write emails formally because of how much I do it at work, but it was less formal, but it was more prompt. The notion of email, um, it still felt a little bit like instant messaging, but it also felt like a conversation like instant messaging where you were expected to respond more quickly. Um, it's just that it, it flowed that way. And maybe we were emailing each other more often because we couldn't text each other, mm -hmm. right? It was, that right. was the quick way. I guess they, they were kind of more like text messages, maybe. I don't know. Well, certainly in the Modus Tones era, when we, when we had Andy in the band, and I guess Samir was, must have been on those, uh, tech, those email loops uh, threads. Um, there was a lot of activity, but I, I guess, yeah, and I, I wouldn't have had a cell phone at that point, so um, we weren't texting as a band, I know that. And, and even when we did get cell phones, texting used to be, they would charge you per text. Right, and it, you'd have to like hit the thing three times to get the letter yep. or whatever, so. Yep. Yeah, we had the candy bar phones, yeah, so it wasn't, um, you know, that wasn't a thing, we didn't have touchscreen phones, so it was just, it was just the world was very different and you can just feel it by reading through um, the emails. And I liked our uh, habit of always signing the email by some random name, which is something mm -hmm. we've done from, I think you started it because you wrote me a note once and you signed it, you know, like, um, you know, Johnny Baggy Boots, whatever it was. <laughs> and I thought it was the greatest thing. And so I would always do it back. And that was always um, a thing. One. <laughs> One random memory I have from chemistry class was um, I'm like, hey, I came up with some new lyrics and I wrote the most horrible cliched metal lyrics about a dragon breathing fire, whatever. I think we still have it somewhere. It was clearly, at least in my view, a joke. And you read it and you thought I was serious and you hated them. <laughs> 
a euro back you're like hey you're like i don't know i'm not sure you know i, I think yeah, i appreciate you do it like this still needs work or whatever <laughs> like you're trying to find a polite way to tell me that they were terrible i'm like dude it was a joke <laughs> and you didn't smile <laughs> inside maybe i think i was afraid you were serious <clears throat> um yeah so one thing we didn't talk about was uh all the, the cartoons we used to draw back and forth the comics yep i mean uh, I, I think every cartoon was about half a point off of uh at least my my grade point average or whatever um <laughs> it was uh it was that was a, they were so much fun and and even to this day, like I have them, it's in the closet behind me, um, behind the green screen. And uh, it's dangerous. I have to be careful because if I pick it up, I get lost in there reading them. And some of them, some of them are objectively really funny. <laughs> some of them are just funny to me, I think. But some of them are funny. Like we wrote, we wrote some, uh, uh, there's some funny things. And I really, your, your drawing style was really comical too. Like the way, the way that you drew physical comedy was really funny um also but uh yeah we spent a lot of time drawing uh cartoons yeah it was very uh i mean i think those type of things are really what help bond bond people right to actually spend that time their creative energy and and then the my my the punchline basically it was it was a little bit like um not the three stooges but maybe like uh Bonnie and Fred or, or the, the honeymooners um, pair. There's a, I, there was like, I was putting myself in the alpha male role and I would like always hurt you. Oh yeah, that's and, right. You, you would, you would, <laughs> you would have ruthlessly beat me <laughs> in those. And I didn't know, that's right. I forgot about that. Like, or I didn't think of it. I, I didn't know what to make of that. It was really violent. And, but in some respects, like comics are violent, right? Mm -hmm. This, th these were not, they, they were drawn like they were like Sunday comic strips in the newspaper, but re in real, really we were doing it like they were comic books. <laughs> and there's a lot of violence in there, but you kept, you had this whole series of where you would start it off like a normal back and forth. And they'd be like, hey, if I, let's play Smash. And you would like <laughs> smash me over the head with something. And I don't, I don't know if you were, if you just thought it was funny or if you were taking out some like pent up frustration with my musicianship in the band there, or I don't know what it was, but um, I mean, it was pretty brutal. <laughs> but the funny thing is that you, you like looking at those comics, you know, so it couldn't have been well, too funny. traumatic. <laughs> you pushed me off a cliff. You, you didn't really push me off a cliff. Right. So. Yeah, no, definitely passive aggressive type of something there, right? I guess yeah. so, but I, and and it, it did it probably, you know, you did it once, and then I thought it was funny. Right, so yeah, was why wouldn't you keep it. doing it, right? So if it was cathartic for you because you were annoyed about something, and I thought it was funny, then why wouldn't you keep doing it? Yeah, right. It was. It was. I think that was pretty much what it was, and uh, somehow I I was able to envision that, and I I took um, a drawing class at Madison. Uh, I think it was a uh, 95 uh, fall semester. So I would have, I was just kind of had learned some new drawing techniques to, to do motion and to just be able to, uh, so I was, just felt, I can remember that the face and yeah, I, I remember how I did motion and I just drew like the hand is like a little circle. and uh, <laughs> Yeah, like as you were punching me in the face and my teeth were flying out, you would show the, and that's an actual thing you would show the motion very well, actually. There was, you would put like, yeah, no, yeah, I guess you, you were applying the techniques um, that, that you learned to, uh, to cause me harm. Mm -hmm. Good job. Um, no, I'm talking about the drawing techniques, Jason, the drawing techniques. <laughs> <laughs> so when is this gonna go, when are we gonna start going live? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hit the live button soon. I just wanna warm you up. Okay. Just want to uh, grease the grease the axle first. <laughs> yeah, like this whole time, like I don't, you know, I've never done anything like this before, and I know it's, the, you know, what I like about these is that you, you know, it's laid back, it goes where it goes, and it's like sitting in on a conversation. But um, uh, I, uh, 
I don't know. Um, I guess there's no way how these are supposed to go, but it doesn't, it's just, you know, we're just in, I'm enjoying the conversation. I don't know if it really it doesn't feel like a, uh, um, a live broadcast, but it does say yeah. live on Facebook. Yeah, it does. Um, and then, you know, I'll put it up on YouTube and then it'll be there and people can listen to it and we can listen to it. Uh, when we are curious of how we were on October 8th, 2021. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, we do have to, uh, at least uh, a couple of consistent watchers. Thank you so much for hanging out. And I know later on, um, people will watch the replay and thank you for watching the replay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun hanging out um, with friends and especially old friends like Jason. It's uh, like you, Jason. It's, I mean, we can talk endlessly, but you, you have time for a few more questions. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any uh, setbacks? Actually, let me skip that. Uh, do you have a spiritual philosophy that informs what you do and how you live? Yeah, um, uh, it's a good question, and I'm not, I'm not a very spiritual person. Um, I, I appreciate spirituality, um, but I'm, I'm so, I'm very analytical and data driven, and my spirit, my former spirituality comes in. Uh, driving a drive to like understand things so uh, i'll put it this way that there are people who can create meaning in something i'm more driven to find the meaning and what i'm what i'm trying to say about that is like there may be a song like don't stop believing where um people will form their own interpretation of it and they'll think about what that song means to them i'm driven to learn about the song and find out well what were the what were they thinking when they wrote it where did the lyrics come from um where are the details about it and that's where i form um my view of it now with that said uh so i grew up uh uh, uh in conservative judaism which is uh more traditional um and uh when I uh, moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico for three years. I'm sorry, actually, it hasn't come up yet. Your your visit to mm -hmm. Albuquerque and stuff. Maybe maybe there'll be something to that. Um, um, we uh, we joined a reform synagogue. Uh, so there, there were there there actually weren't a lot of synagogues um, in Albuquerque in general. So there was like sort of one of each uh, movement. And I was exposed to to the you know that style. It, its roots come from. Um, I think it was like the late 1800s where it started, where the idea was to take Judaism and become more like, um, uh, uh, more like Christianity to try to um, sort of evolve the method of worship, not, not to, you know, still be Jewish, but to, you know, the, their, their, the synagogues were designed more like churches. They would play music during services. They would have organs and everything. And, the idea that's you know during the service the you know the rabbi the cantor they're playing guitar and that like blew my mind because mm -hmm. uh you know up to that point in my life everything in terms of you know spirituality in terms of like observing things um on the jewish holidays it was all acapella for lack of a better description and i would i i found those songs the arrangements even the chord changes, the way that it was being performed to be, to move me in a way that I hadn't experienced before. Because I, I you know, I had some, uh, I, I went to Israel, it must have been 2005 or 2006. And I went, the, you know, one of the big parts of the trip was to go to the hotel, go to the wall. And I went there and I, it was a fraction of the, experience that I expect the feelings that I expected to feel knowing the significance of the site um and so you know but then for me like when it comes to music and it's tie into to the history and, and the observance and and the meaning that actually moves me so um uh there are some songs and arrangements where you know for, for lack of a better description like when I hear it it like like lifts me up, like elevates me for a moment where um, 
you know, I imagine that's a, that's a feeling where people who are more spiritual in 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 their um, uh, in their nature feel very often, and in that in that respect, I'm like uh, envious, even though you're not supposed to be according to one of the commandments. I'm envious of people who uh, are able to feel that spirituality more naturally because it's really something. But for me, it's the thing that's gotten me there is my music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds about right to me, knowing you that, uh, as you said, you wouldn't particularly regard yourself as spiritual, but that music kind of helps you get there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, James uh, Behan chimed in and said that that's some good contextualization of songs, not that different from what is done with the Bible, what was the literary musical form being used and what was the historical context of the passage of the song? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I actually read, uh, I've been reading some of the Bible lately because I'm uh, really getting very interested in fasting recently. And um, there's uh, a great book I bought called The Miracle of Fasting. And the guy has a Christian background and he um, refers to Bible texts about how many times fasting appeared in the Bible, so many. And uh, yeah, so it's always fascinating to me. Of course, I want to know what, and where was this written? What was going on at the time? And, um, yeah, and I, that's also why I like to tell people about the way I wrote songs. Not that I have the opportunity to do so too often, but I did a, at least one podcast type of thing like that. Because I was always curious when I listened to music like, what what was behind that song and so, sometimes it's disappointing sometimes they're like oh no no that was nothing i just looked at random things from a newspaper and you, you whatever you made of it fine it's good to know that um yeah sometimes people the inspiration of the song is actually much less interesting than what you've made it yourself as as a you know listener you know so sometimes, sometimes it's a little deflating, but but I, I generally like that approach too, to know yeah. what's behind it. And, and, you know, and so much of the music from earlier centuries has survived. So many of them were commissioned pieces for right. the purposes of observance. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, the, I don't, I wonder what that felt for the composers. Were they invested in the spirituality of that piece or were they looking at it as a um you know as a, their job to uh, create this for uh, to to um you know were they viewing it that they're writing this for the creator or are they writing it for their um uh client right mm -hmm. i don't know that was probably some of both right and i was and i imagine client would be more like uh, what's the word um uh, not sponsored, but like uh, whatever. Yeah, I was struggling to find the right word they'd, too. Yeah, they, they'd be kind of holding you for a long time and kind of giving you food and all that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just a, a kind of inspired the, the thought when you mentioned spiritually inclined people. Um, I, I do, I, I read today, and, and it makes a lot of sense to me that when you fast, uh, fasting induces spirituality after a certain period, you know, and uh, like Moses spent 40 days fasting in the desert, so did Jesus, and there's probably countless other examples of, uh, Gandhi did a lot of fasting, and he's regarded as a highly spiritual figure, so I imagine at a certain point when the system is cleansed of all the toxins that, that we have, especially in our modern world, um, and then all the energy that we, that's used to, uh, you know, break down food and all that, is, is allowed to just heal the body. And then from there, it's like, okay, now we're gonna uh, improve mental acuity and then and perception will be times however much, you know, so you could see more in, in the world that we can't see now. And spiritual interests just grow naturally. So, you know, I, yeah. I imagine that's something we could all access more of if we, you know, chose to, to try to do something like that. Yeah. And, you know, it makes sense. I mean, I, I've read that, you know, there's a process when, when the body goes through, I don't know what you call it, like the cycle of, you know, where, where there's, um, it goes into a starvation mode. Um, the feelings of hunger go away, the body starts processing the stored up um, energy. And a lot of people will report sort of there's this like feeling of euphoria, 
um, mm-hmm. that, that, that they experience. And uh, the same thing when there are people who, you know, have almost died of hypothermia. They talk about there's a point where, well, it's like, I didn't even feel cold anymore. I actually felt perfectly warm and euphoric and everything. So um, it's interesting that, you know, the body, I mean, call it what you will, you know, from like an evolutionary standpoint or whatever, but you're, 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 you know, you could describe being near death as being close to your creator, right, in a way, mm-hmm. and that's a euphoric experience. So it's almost like, you know, going on the edge, but they, it seems like this is how we're wired too. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting thing to think about. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, just a fun side question. Uh, how many different places outside of Brooklyn do you think can you? Uh, I we could probably count it up, but have we been together? Because uh, you're definitely the friend I've been outside of Brooklyn with the most. I would say. Yeah. So obviously there was Norway, mm-hmm. and Japan. Yeah, Norway. Japan. Um, we we went to India separately. Uh, mm-hmm. We. Um, we went to Brazil Al- separately. Al- Al- yeah, it was Albuquerque, um, Albuquerque when you came out to visit there. And then New Jersey, um, New Jersey. Exotic, uh, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Um, so we never, we didn't go up to Boston together or Albany, though I was the only one that guessed what the statue said that you saw, that you stumbled upon when you mm-hmm. decided to take a bus to Albany. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a uh, old Binghamton and Ithaca. Yeah, Bennington and Ithaca. So yeah, probably those seven, right? And you can count two places in Jersey because she lived in two places. Were you on the class? No, that was not. That. Oh was yeah, the... then yeah, right. Class trip, maybe something. Yeah, and I was thinking junior high school for our eighth grade. We went to D.C., but we didn't know each other yet. There was no. There were no trips. Uh, we went to Hofstra together, probably. Yeah. So Long Island. More, I think more than once. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't really think of going out to the island long island as uh yeah i don't know mm-hmm. that that's uh it's a good i mean those are plenty of places and some very yeah. far away places i just don't know if there's probably something we're forgetting that'll come to me later and then we'll restart the we'll we'll, we'll issue a separate interview yeah. for just that yeah whole another interview just for that and we'll revolve the whole thing around the question we'll kind of look at it from different angles and yeah, or we could. I'll think of it before we go live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we. I'll hit the live button in a few minutes. Just grease, just grease, grease the axle. <laughs> <laughs> Pumping the, the axle. tires. <laughs> Pumping the. <laughs> Pumping the tires. Uh, it's good to, to you know. I I think I was probably thirty, seven or something when I discovered that. Uh, nice, Metallica and Brooklyn. I think I was probably 37 when I realized that I'm supposed to have uh, a lot of air in my bike tires. Um, so like I, I didn't want, never want to have too much. I always did the, the field test. So as long as I could push in a tiny bit, I thought that was gonna be good. Well, <laughs> my friend was like, my friend was like, look, there's, you see it says uh, inflate to this pressure, right? And then I got a, a pump that actually gauges it. So then I would inflate it closer to the lower end of the of the recommended thing but i was biking on 15 a psi when if my bike is uh, recommends 50 to, to 65 or 40 to 65 and i was on 15 to 20 most of the time well i guess you liked uh you like the ride i mean there are scenarios where you might want to do that but um now i'm reminded of when we did the bike ride into manhattan yeah and mm-hmm. we rode over the brooklyn bridge which was awesome and then we were, it was the village, and we hopped up a curb, and my tire went pop. pop. Yeah. And that was the end of that adventure. And it was like, oh man, I don't have a, pa-. it was like, oh, you, you don't carry a patch kit? I'm like, no. I'm like, do you? No. Does anyone? And we're like, no, I guess not. It's like, well, you know, it's like 9 30 at night. I don't think we can find a bike shop. I'm like, no. I'm like, all right, well, I guess let's get on the subway and go home. That's, yeah yeah that's what it was. but who knows it might have saved our life maybe we would have had a, a bump 
bumpy or ride on the way home. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't looking forward to biking up the Brooklyn Bridge again. <laughs> I was looking forward to riding down, though. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe our plan was all along to take the subway home. It must have been because we, it's like in, a, what is it, in a Gattaca where he's swimming out. And it's like, how do you go? And he's like, I don't leave anything for the swim back. It's like, with what we were doing and how late it was, we were not leaving anything for the ride home. We must have <laughs> planned to take the subway all along subconsciously whether we said it or not yeah um yeah so I, I like the background now uh because i mean i like this version because you get that metallica poster so that whole wall for anyone who's watching by the way that was 1995 basement it's and before uh, i was down there yeah before jason uh came down and uh that whole wall which is a big wall i don't know what the dimensions are all dedicated to Metallica posters. And that VCR had, when you opened it, the uh, the eject button, the thing raised, it came up and then you put the, the t- tape in yep. and push it down. That was a pop-up, but th- this was not the TV that the hole got burned in. That was a different TV. I could see the other TV was black. I have a picture yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, what about um, any Modus Tollens memories? Uh, that, that jump out? Um, I mean, the auditions were really something. Uh, mm, yeah. Um, you know, some of the people that, uh, you know, that we came across and, and you know, the, the, I'm talking about auditions for a singer, for anyone who, who doesn't, needs the, doesn't have the context. Uh, and it was, it was a big deal because, you know, for you, and for, for me, as, as you know, I call, you know, I was calling myself your biggest fan um, to be on the supporting end of saying, well, there should be a different singer than you in your band where you wrote the songs. Like you should be the songwriter and guitarist or the singer songwriter guitarist was. Um, and by the way, I never got that where there's like, oh, I'm a singer, I'm a singer songwriter. I'm like, why is that a thing and why is it said with as if there's it's a, it's one long word but i digress <laughs> i really understood it um but uh the um i mean that was a big and I, I think that was a big moment just in terms of of called growing up facing reality um mm-hmm. just realizing that you know the e you know and i don't mean in a negative way it was an ego thing just by definition where it's like, no, I should be the singer. Um, and just sort of, you know, it was humbling and it was it was hard for, um, I, I feel like I'm the one that told you, maybe. No, I don't I, think I it don't, was- I don't really remember. I don't think it was an intervention thing. I don't clearly remember either. Um, but uh, I, I look back on it as just like, it was one of those big, learning moments you know realizing that well it doesn't i guess it it, it doesn't always it's not always going to be the same it's not always going to be this way and that mm-hmm. it's time to try something different and mm-hmm. um you know uh in the end like when i look at like district 22 um uh that was a great lineup uh with gabe on vocals and you you really uh were when i remember going to the shows the it would grab everyone's attention when you would go and you would you would put your foot up on the monitor and you would start soloing you know people talk through looking whatever everyone would stop and stare and watch you do that and it was really you know that wouldn't have happened if you were um singing in that band yeah true yeah i I was allowed to finally be the best guitarist, rock guitarist I could be for a little while, you know? Yeah. And other things with most songs, I remember <laughs> Amir, what a champ, and, uh, you know, he would came back from Japan and he was totally jet lagged, but we had a gig. And the plan was to pick him up from the airport and there was a massive amount of traffic and we weren't even gonna be able to get him and he was after a cab. And then Jeremy called up, Jeremy's dad called in a favor and they called him out of line in customs and just walked him out so that he, and then he made it to the gig on time. And the poor guy was so tired, um, but he, oh, uh, uh, he played through the recording of that. You can hear how tired he is uh, in his playing, but he did it with a champ. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have a bunch of live recordings. I don't know, maybe not a bunch. I, I feel like a bunch that I, I somehow cut up and mixed up. I don't know which show they're from. I kind of wish I did because I'd like to put on YouTube as an archive. This show, like I did with the District 22, this show, whatever date, the upper room with all the shows. So if you come across any like clear list of songs or recordings of a show, let me know. I don't think we have anything different, but um, we can compare mm -hmm. them sometime. Yeah. Uh, so James said that um, uh, as we spoke about in our episode, District 22, Modus Tones was the Dave Matthews band about 15 years ahead of its time. Got to hop off. Can we see the rest of it on replay? Yeah, definitely that Modus Tones uh, six piece format was uh, was a Dave, Dave Matthews band. Yeah, band. it's hard. It's hard to, to get that many uh, uh, players um, coordinated. Um, uh, you know, performance aside, right? It was you know getting everyone to because you know it was a this was a, it was a part time thing for everyone, right? It's not like the the band was um, uh, anybody's full time job, so uh, it was uh, it was tough. Like almost every rehearsal had some challenge where someone wasn't there, or couldn't make it, or whatever, and um, it was it was tricky and and. Um, but we sounded, um, we played well together. Like when it was time and it was for us to, to go live, you know, we jammed, but, um, you know, it was showing, it was hard for me to do keyboard and trumpet and, and my chops were not up to, uh, what was really, you know, I, Amir was this really, um, amazing sax player who, who, who was even continuing to study it and continuing to get better as we went along. And I was, you know, a rusty trumpet player who, um, uh, you know, didn't keep my chops up and didn't really have the improvisational skills. And I tried to do way more than I was capable of, which, you know, when I look back, I wish I had just scaled it back or said, you know what, maybe I don't need to play trumpet. A similar, so what I want to say about um, the audition experience, the singing audition, so to, to put context, the uh, Modus Tone started as a three piece with uh, Dave Evans, Jeremy Batch, and myself. And I was the singer and guitar, right, guitarist and songwriter for this tri power trio. And then over time, and Jason joined. And then this idea of uh, me, John, not being the singer came up and uh, was had to be presented to me. So um, I remember it being tough and like definitely a blow to my ego. But now when I listen back to any recordings pre that era, so before 2000 or before, my singing was, was a, a wild, a wild wolf. It was not, uh, not trained. It was energetic, like occasionally sounded in key, but uh, it wasn't wildly out of key, but it was not it wasn't wildly in key, that's for sure. It, 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 was, it was very inconsistent. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it was, um, yeah, there, especially live. I mean, it was, it was not always in key and there was a lot of, um, uh, expressive things that you were doing that were beyond what you should be trying to do in a live setting on a recording where you could do multiple takes. Sure. But live, it was, it was ambitious. So, hmm. you know, um but yeah. uh you know we can look back on it and and uh um and you know even <laughs> our best recording of um uh it's the color the song's blue for me and i'm blacking out on the name uh it's um i cannot requiem person needed at the time i just won't be my own kind of man do 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 i can't remember the name of the song <laughs> uh it was oh, okay now that, we're modus tones okay yeah, yeah modus um, tones yeah Mar uh where that guy marco servant song. Servant yes, song. thank you servant song um where i played the wrong notes at the very beginning and i didn't mm -hmm. like stop i kept trying to get it right <laughs> so our best live recording of it has me playing these i mean it was a half step off somehow it was a half step off from a half step it was like the worst mm -hmm. possible discordant <laughs> notes I could have played. And I didn't stop because I'm like, no, wait, I'll get it. I'll get it. 
and uh, you know <laughs> it puked all over this otherwise really good recording of the song yeah that's funny and it is the best recording we have of that song and um pretty much and uh yeah that's how i know it. that's how i know it's the best recording though because i hear those right. notes I'm like, okay, I see there's one. that <laughs> and then uh and then i remember our one good recording of dark winter we started off and i don't know what i didn't like about it but i wanted the band to stop and start over and you gave me and you were like no man we're good like stop whatever and then we finished it 11 minutes later and I was like, we should have stopped. You're like, why? No, like we gotta, we gotta play through. Like it, it was one of those heated moments. And then it turned out that my last note, donk, the tape ended. Yeah. <laughs> Had it been five seconds later, it would have cut off my whole outro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was like had we stopped and had I gotten what I wanted, it would have screwed everything up and we wouldn't have that recording. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. glad that uh, you know we powered through but recording was so hard back then and i remember the first time we went to the studio and we recorded requiem there was the part where the keyboard harmonized with the guitar right at the beginning and we were so excited when we heard it we high-fived each other and played right. it over like a whole bunch of times and everybody else was like can we just hear the rest of the song <laughs> it was that was exciting stuff oh yeah i remember hearing that i i feel I feel like we listened to that in my mother's in the living room of my mother's house. Is that possible? Or no, it where, was, it was I remember it was in the basement. Um uh I remember I was sitting next to the door to your utility closet. Um whatever that storage room. So no, it was in the basement. So you think we came back from rehearsal the same day or you came it back? It was the same day. day. No, we came mm -hmm. back and we went like we had the tape and mm -hmm. it was like a hot, it was like hot warm in our hands it was still warm from the recording <laughs> process we're like let's listen to it we were so excited it was like a big deal so um yeah yeah oh, that's awesome and so if, if you came over afterwards we must have went to the rehearsal studio pretty early right because we your mom picked us up and dropped us off i remember that um you know putting your guitar in the back um so you know it was probably like we had it booked like six to eight at electric plant something like that mm -hmm. it was our first time at electric plant doing the two track live and we booked two hours we got going we played through a bunch of stuff and then we got back so maybe it was like 8 30 at your house mm -hmm. afterwards something like that um so yeah i wonder i wonder if it was our first time electric plant or our first time with your electric plant because i have recording of like playing ss that says really good recording quality and Armageddon that uh, um, we couldn't, I don't think we could have got a fast one. I thought that was, uh, so I possibly, think that, that couldn't have been the single Odeon, right? No, there's one very good one. It's, I think it has to be an electric plant that has, that would be pre, that predates Requiem anyway. You had been to, a, I don't think, I thought, I, I thought I went with you for the very first time to electric plant. So, so may possibly, I think it's a, yeah, I, I very, I believe that, but I just don't, I'm oh no! It maybe... was that session. You played those older songs. I just didn't play on them. Right, but I'm thinking maybe, maybe Requiem was like a, a, a second, the second time. Oh, maybe. I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. It was the second time. Yeah. Right. So I, I think I remember the first time you were, you were sitting out a lot of songs. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe so. Um, and the, uh, those those uh, sessions was with Mikey on bass, right? We never went to Electric Plan with Jeremy. I don't Jeremy? think so. I think it was all Mikey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or without a bass player, did we go? No. Oh, we tried so. that gig at CBGB without a bass player. That did not go well. No. Um, so one quick uh, thing I want to share for anyone that's made it this far about this guy, just to just to tell you about, um, you know, the, the, the stone-faced metalhead sort of... Um, uh, there's this thing that I don't know if I can ever repay you for this. I don't know if I, I don't think I have to, but we were uh, in high school in marching band and we were going to march and I believe it was the St. Patrick's Day parade in Staten Island. And it was like 34 degrees out or so. It was cold <laughs> and we're all bundled up or whatever. And um, we get going to play and I forgot my gloves or they fell out of my, I don't know. I lost them. I forgot them. So here we were 
freezing cold trying to play trumpet and I had no gloves. And so what did this guy do? He gave me one of his gloves. Ooh. And John and I spent the parade like every three minutes, every, between every song, switching the glove to the other hand to try to give the other hand some relief. And I felt terrible, but you insisted. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, that was like, because so, I don't know if I can, for anyone who's never played a cold, imagine playing, you're, you're holding this cold metal brass instrument <laughs> where it's windy and freezing cold and you're out there for an hour and a half marching like that that was that was intense like on um, you know bordering dangerous and um uh i will never forget that thank you yeah I, i'm glad you remember that i appreciate it uh yeah i i, I think uh at the end of the day i'd like to at least be able to believe that i do try to um care about my fellow man yeah oh absolutely but it, it was just sort of thing like it's not it's not so much that you did like i didn't ask you to do it i wouldn't no. have asked you to do it no you i just, remember that you just no. did it and that um i think if if you were at, if someone were asked to do it it wouldn't take away from the generosity but it was like it wasn't this thought you're like here man take one of my gloves and i was like i don't want to do that to you it's so cold you're like no no, no just this way we'll switch off or whatever and um it was uh um i don't know it's just something i was so grateful because i had really screwed i basically really screwed up right and um i don't know how i would have gotten through i probably would have lived but how i've gotten through the parade um mm -hmm. without any gloves because you can't again for, for trumpet you can't put your hands in your pockets you gotta no. you, you're, hold, you're holding a trumpet and when you're playing it requires two hands you can kind of do it with one but we have those music things on it like you needed two hands and yeah. those trumpets didn't have like um a leather wrap on it or anything like mm -hmm. it was uh um that was tough so yeah there would have been no escape really from the hands freezing no so so yeah. thanks for that yeah, um and so uh and um um, that's why I, I, that's why I did doing it like Fogarty, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. We they didn't even scratch Japan. Or barely didn't touch Albuquerque much. But uh, I know uh, how how were you on time? And I, I think you said roughly till five or so. Yeah, yeah. I got a little, you know um, a little bit more time. Um, it's fine. Uh, it's just uh, you know maybe we'll um, we'll uh, if you're up for it, plan for a a sequel. Yes, yeah. Or we'll, Certainly. we'll probably talk the about the same things. Yeah, we'll just go over the same stuff and, and not get to the other things we didn't talk about. Just rehash everything we already talked about. So if it, when this is on YouTube or Facebook, this is just a, a test. If you're still listening, and, and it's totally cool for people who aren't, right? It's a, um, it's a long stretch, but go into the comments and type uh, still well, listening at two hours and uh or uh, is it is there like a catchphrase that we used to use or no or music oh, is well, life music is life it's right behind you mm -hmm. okay take, yeah, take so that's behind you right right music is life in the comment right now and we thank you yes and, we'll, and we'll subscribe be... if you're not subscribed on youtube subscribe yes that would be a shame if you didn't um so just one fun story about the marching band. Uh, I remember what was happening with the marching band towards the end. I don't know. I remember it happened later than sooner. Uh, I had these black pants. <laughs> you know, going oh, I was, I was going to bring that up with the hair. Uh, yeah, I had these. <laughs> that was the same day. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I probably discovered it. And it happened a few times. So I didn't realize to change the pants. Uh, my leg hair was just popping through the black pants. Well, what happened was you were kneeling like you used to always do. Right. Um, you just John was was a croucher for anyone who doesn't know this. And uh, I look at his pants when he's crouching. I'm like, dude, I think you got Strider's hair. Like his dog, you have dog hair on your pants, and you you're like trying to brush it off. You're like, oh, it won't come off. And you grabbed it and pulled, and you're like, ah, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, these pants somehow your your leg hairs would come every time you would kneel they would like and it was the weirdest thing it was like uniformly distributed across the pants then you would stand up and they would retract and disappear it was like the worst like wolverine power 
<laughs> sort of thing ever with retractable leg hairs. But that must have made the that must have meant that the pants were not warm at all. If it the wind blew, you must have felt everything through it. Yeah, there must have been quite a good amount of holes, uh, spacious yeah, but, holes in there. Now that was the same. Uh, it was the same parade that uh, we Where noticed I discovered that. that. Yeah. Okay. Because I know it went on for a few other parades. Oh yeah, you kept wearing it, and it was always yeah. a source of uh, entertainment. Yeah, but it's similar. That reminds me of when I had the skill of uh, being able to push my nose and have worms of grease pop out of my nose uh, pores. Do you remember that? Um, yeah, but I mean, I think most people can do that. No. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, that's true. I mean, I, I never really did it to demonstrate for others, mm -hmm. um, but I can do that, oh, I guess. Okay. The, yeah. Well, I think the interesting part about it is that you went and ahead and demonstrated it for people. Right, or that I told everyone right now. Or you told everyone, yeah. Yeah, but if after I fast for 40 days, I'll, I'll try it. I probably won't be able to do it. Maybe not. Well, if you're dehydrated, right, um, a little bit, maybe there won't be the grease produced. But... Um, this is the thing. Anything we say now, we'll know that only the people that put music is life in the comments heard it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that's something, I think. <laughs> it's a thing. Um, one thing, and, 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 and uh, just, you know, I'm glad that um, uh, James mentioned it and brought it up. I mean, like the Doing It Like Forwardy project, I mean, Forwardy, it, 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 it will be done by next week. Um, like done done where the other videos are released on the YouTube channel. Um, I know no one's been anxiously awaiting them. It, you know, the 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 cornucopia one and the birthday one were really the the big ones. But um, that every time when it's on, I watch it, whatever, and there's that thing where I fade to black and you hear these voices singing the song and then it fades in. And it's the four music teachers. There's there's something about that moment, like that achievement that I would have never, I think back to us back then, I just would have never imagined that, that something like that would ever happen or be possible. Um, and um, th there's that moment. And then you give the shout out to um, Madison from your other podcast and there's all these people and it jumps in. Um, like a lot of, you know, I, I don't think it was like predetermined or anything, but just a lot of things had to happen uh, almost coincidentally for that to do it. Like you mentioned Madison and I managed to connect to all the teachers and they got everything in or whatever. Um, uh, that, uh, that moment is, is still pretty exciting to me. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's magical. Uh, when I saw that, I was like, holy cow, this guy just un unveiling layer after layer of, of wow. Yeah. yeah, like I, I wish it were ready uh, for your birthday, but then it wouldn't have been what it was because even like the ideas of how to put it together <clears throat> didn't come until later. But, um, you know, I'll just sort of reiterate what I said at the time that when one of the reasons, the reason that project became so overwhelming was the, just the massive response I got from everyone that wanted to contribute um, to celebrate your birthday. So that, that was what buried me I just wasn't expecting it to be such a big response. Um, and uh, I, I feel like a lot, of, a lot of people that participated in that have a love story or something like that. So, um, and, and I just also to point out like the people, so many people that on your birthday that joined talked about the, the way that you inspired them to become a musician. I mean, that, that definitely true with me um, i love the stuff that like mark frankel said um you know and and there were others that came in so um you know i i just think uh, you're the host of the podcast and everything but i just want to i want to highlight that because you know music is life that 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 um it's been you know the theme has come up again and again in this conversation it's about connection yeah yeah and thank you so much for anyone who hasn't watched the uh epic cornucopia uh, doing it like Fogarty video. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. Um, uh, please check it out. The doing like Fogarty playlist and go check those out. That It's a massive 40th birthday present that uh, Jason spearheaded um, with, with the help of a lot of other people, but Jason really 
burn the candle at both ends for that to make it happen. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to see you're healthy and you're, and you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, spending time with my family again. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I don't know. I don't think there are that many celebrities in the world who could say they've experienced that much love, that type of title wave of love. So uh, that maybe attention, but that true love that I felt from that was the, uh, the essence of it. And, and you, you could see from your very unique perspective of me that, that's what my life is about is making those connections. And uh, even if it financially or whatever didn't or fame wise never kind of paid off uh, the way I might've dreamed it would, those connections are real. And then when you put that in my face for my 40th birthday, that was the, the best present imaginable. The best thing I could ever, you know, some people have to die for that to happen, right? So fortunately I didn't have to die to to see how appreciated i am you know now that's a very very important yeah that is a really interesting way to look at it too because um you know what brings people together right like weddings and funerals that, that whole thing and it's like um you often hear that like you know hearing of of supporting funerary for someone that's no longer with us and um uh yeah i get i mean that uh that was like bringing people together for a wedding, right? It was it was getting everyone um, from all these different aspects of your life, not people that you talk to every day, people you collaborated with uh, long ago. So that's a cool way of looking at it too. But it was, um, uh, uh, you know, definitely brought together a lot of my experience and the things I, I you know, that came through music and producing your albums. Like it just brought everything together um you know into that effort even back to like the 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 humorous videos we made in your basement like mm -hmm. i had to tap everything to make that um video into what i envisioned um it to be and uh you know i'm usually uh really critical of of anything i've done but like that there are a couple of things if i could tweak now i would um but i that is that is as close to what I wanted it to be as maybe any big project I've ever done. Yeah, yeah, that's a masterpiece, especially that one, the epic collab, you know, where you said like the James Madison teachers come in and then and all the Madison alumni. And that you were able to find that clip from that random various uh, you know Facebook live shows I did. You found the clip where I actually shout out to Madison and and somehow you made it work as if it was like pre-written yeah it does feel like uh uh too good to be true is not the way i want to say it, it just does feel like the universal right, universal support yeah. you know yeah it was universally supported yeah that was awesome so before we go uh can you share up to three inspiring books films or shows that you'd like to recommend to our listeners i did recommend a show um central park uh it happens to be something that when Haley and I have a moment we've been um grabbing episodes uh I just think you know sometimes you, you know you see something it's just it's just so it's so well done and then you know just from a an artistic and creative standpoint you have to admire um, what they've done um movies that have really you know when asked about my favorite movie for, for a long time and I guess probably still is shine is one of them and the funny thing is you saw it before I did uh oh. you saw it in the theater so it's a it's a um a semi it's a little fiction a little non-fiction but it's a um I forget the term for that but a, a biography of a David Helfgott pianist mm -hmm. who um uh you know dealt with um mental illness and then made a comeback and um uh it uh is really masterfully done, but you went and saw it in the theater and you told me a couple of things about it. And to be honest, you didn't describe it. Um, you focused on one aspect of it and I didn't really grok or follow what the whole thing was. And then I went and saw it and I was blown away. Um, I recommend that to anyone who hasn't seen it. It's also a really good film for understanding how to use lighting and camera shots and and there's a lot of emotion in that film that's not spoken mm -hmm. so there's a really great example um of that 
Um, and uh, who else um, comes to mind? I'm sure given a little bit more time and a lot more sleep, um, I would come up with more uh, recommendations off um, the top of my head. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll think of some things for next time, maybe. So, yeah, no books jump to mind? Uh, the, the single string method. It's a real <laughs> page turner. Well, look, I plan to use it when, um, uh, if, if either of my daughters want to learn guitar, we'll uh, mm -hmm. start off with that. You know, it's been a long time since I've been able to sit down and read a book. And, and I was talking to Haley about this last night, actually, that even if I did have the time, there's so many distractions from reading. There's so much opportunity to, you know, feed off the dopamine drivers to go and watch a video on YouTube or, you know, uh, rewatch something or, you know, listen to a podcast. Um, I would love to sit on a chair outside and read a book. Um, and I hope to do it again one day, but I couldn't tell you when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the, the, the lousy part. So I have this, you know, stack of books that I want to read. Most of the books that I've read over the past years have been nonfiction, like things about like um, business or, you know, self-improvement books, things like that. Um, I haven't been able to read a book fiction probably since like I was commuting on the subway before I had kids. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I, I'm, I know I'm a bit unusual with how much I read, I guess, but uh, I, I, what I can say is that as an adult, I think for most people, unless you're retired, it is, and you get the temptation of the computer and all these things you kind of wish you could do. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I do find when I get a chance, I sit outside in the back. <clears throat> and I, I, just before this podcast, 20 minutes, I, I sat with this fasting book and I've been taking notes because I really want to absorb it. And just sitting in the sun, it's much, much more gentle on the eyes than a computer screen looking at a page and uh, having the, instead of like typing something, having this and putting in a book and going to the notes that I'm just, I know exactly, well, there it is in my hand. And yeah, yeah. You, anyway. You remember it better. You absorb it better. Um, typing and reading on a screen. I mean, it's, it's been proven. It does not um it doesn't stimulate the mind the same way yeah that makes sense to me and it's certainly not as relaxing um you can't really read on a computer outdoors the sunlight doesn't use it doesn't really work that well uh you could i mean with the umbrella or something but uh yeah I mean, nothing like a good old-fashioned paper book mm -hmm. uh anything any plans in the upcoming several months you'd like to just say out loud um, I mean, I'm going through a change. I'm, I'm changing jobs. I'm in the in-between jobs period right now. And um, I'm going to be doing something that's a little bit different uh, than I was doing before. So that's exciting. Um, uh, it, um, you know, it's been sort of reaching this, um, you know, this pivotal point with, uh, with our kids where um, Sorvel's five and, and Zaya's um, two. And, uh, you know, Zaya has been in uh, preschool and Ravel is in the same school doing kindergarten. And for Zaya, it's, you know, it's a quick, it's like two and a half hours that she's there. Um, but uh, I don't know, they're, they're, you know, everything's a blur, everything goes quickly, they're growing up and, um, you know, sort of there's this milestone, well, wow, they're, they're both in school, it's crazy. And um, I don't know, everything is, uh, um, I think part of it probably just comes with getting older. The, the pandemic certainly hasn't helped, but like time is so nebulous and then it's a blur. So trying to identify milestones and really celebrate them to sort of mark it in my mind of, you know, here's, put a stake in the ground, here's when this happened. Because I can, I can remember our high school and college years in terms of timing better than I can remember the last decade or two. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just how it gets stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I know, uh, yeah, I certainly wish you all the best in your new job. And I'm glad to see you have a new chapter ahead, a change of pace, you know, shake off the old skin and uh, bring forth the new, new you. 
Great. It's going to be great. Um, and I'm sure you'll have more creative projects for us in the next uh, few months, next year, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to it. I mean, it, it, it had been so many years since I've just created, right, to use that term. And um, uh, your, the Doing It Like Forwardy project was sort of this, this culmination of like gradually going towards it, starting with like making a few fun videos for the family for occasions, right? Once the pandemic started to getting overly obsessive and hyper-focused on, you know, different tactics and techniques. I, I, um, I'm not proud of how long um, I spent um, tackling the, uh, I'm gonna turn off the virtual background. Um, wait, how do I just turn it off? Uh, to, oh, here it is. To um, just get this green screen lighting right. Like, I know it looks simple, but if, if the lighting's not just right, the chroma key doesn't work right. So um, I'm trying to learn to, again, not make such a big deal out of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and not to like overdo things to the point, like understanding the, the idea of minimum viable product. Once you reach minimum viable product, everything you do after that is elective. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of the mindset I'm trying to take. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you familiar with Seth Godin? Name doesn't ring a bell, but what's... Um... Oh, by the way, my, Linda, my mother, Linda Sher Sheridan says, music is life. Hey, wow, that was a uh, live, hey there. still there. Oh, so she's still that. here. Oh my gosh. Yes, thanks for hanging out. And, and I think she, <laughs> I think she wrote it and then, and then. Uh, yeah, music is watching. life, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, what was I talking about? Uh, uh, we were talking about minimum viable products. Yeah, yeah, so Seth Godin has this idea. Uh, he might use MVP, I don't know, but um, his idea is uh, just probably is ship. So his idea is ship, ship, ship. So as soon as you have something that's ready to go, you ship it. It's 1.0, you can make 1.1, but unless you ship it, it's basically useless. Yep, it's you know? the concept around um, DevOps uh, and, and or, uh, the agile methodologies but the, the idea is that you know historically like software development would be done using what's called the waterfall model where you put all this effort you develop the requirements of what you need and then you develop it in stages and then you're done a year later and the requirements have changed right mm -hmm. and now you're playing catch up so the idea is smaller iterations so every two weeks you should be releasing something and deliver and ship it's that it's that same idea and um it, it shifts the way that you think about things right because you have to now you have to create something that is that can be delivered, mm -hmm. not the whole big grand thing. And and I definitely waterfalled that year birthday stuff, which is why I wasn't ready on time, right? I didn't have the product that day because I left it to the end. I'm like, all right, I can just get a render out. And then I couldn't. And that was mm -hmm. pretty upsetting um, because I didn't have something to ship in iterations. If I had... I would have just been able to go back to my previous shippable version and say, well, it's not what I wanted, but at least I have something. Right. That lesson learned. Yeah, yeah. And then that it comes to uh, perfectionism that we all may face that aspect of ourselves at different points. Um, there's one of, yeah, so like the days of writing the epic novel of Gone with the Wind, 900 page. There's just no uh, culture for that anymore, right? No, so no appetite for it. No, and people wouldn't be able to consume it if you did create this huge, massive work. So uh, yeah, smaller chunks and then just consistency and rep repeating that muscle and then listening and actually incorporating what, what we learn from each of those iterations of the, you know, our, whatever our product might be. Yep. Yep. So this has been truly awesome. I, I, I hope we can do a part two before too long. Um, I know when you have your new job, you know, you may get pretty busy, but uh, we'll see. When, whenever uh, we can manage it, we'll, we'll do yeah. it again. Yeah, we'll schedule time. It sounds good. And um, uh, just as a closing thing, the next thing that I, uh, I should have to send you is uh, for that 
Halloween thing that Charles Bertude put out. Mm -hmm. um, I went a little crazy. So I recorded, a, I wrote a trumpet bit and I recorded a duet to that. But my Halloween costume is going to be a full face deep fake of Charles, which I'm wondering, and that's why I have the green screen up too. I'm wondering if that's going to come across as super creepy as opposed to a funny Halloween costume where I've literally stolen his likeness. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, I wouldn't mind. I'm, I'll send it your way. Maybe before I send it to him, I'd love your thoughts on it. And sure. uh, for any of you music is lifers, um, hopefully it'll make the cut and it'll be available uh, if you want to see it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Charles Bertude is a really great uh, bass player. You can follow on YouTube and check out his amazing videos. They're entertaining, and he's also quite an exceptional musician. Yeah, quite a virtuoso. Yeah. All right. Well, this is great. This is really, um, really a privilege, John. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you on. It's uh, been long, long, long time coming, in my opinion. So I'm glad, glad you made it happen. We made it happen and uh, I'll send you the links, the YouTube link when it's up and Facebook link and you can, uh, I don't know, share it with anybody if, if you think they'd be interested. Well, I'll definitely leave my own Music is Life comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good times. Thanks, John. Right. Peace out. See you later. Thank you everybody for watching. Are we ready?